else is watching. So today, today, and I know you remember last Monday, last Monday was the 100th anniversary of the birth of John Kennedy. Seems unimaginable, doesn't it? A hundred years ago. Not that we were alive in 1917. If you are or were, I'd like to know what you have for breakfast because you're really doing well. You've got quite a lifeline. But the assassination more than 50 years ago, that is, that, that's a tough one to, to wrap your head around, that it was 50 years ago. But we're here to celebrate a life, and we're here to celebrate Kennedy's election in November of 19, in November of 1960. And I'd have to check my records, but I think this is the first of three, you know, maybe four presidents, or four or three, five, whatever. This is, we'll say several. All right, this is, this is the first of several presentations on, on John Kennedy and the Kennedy presidency. And, you know, in that, you know, what we'll be talking about is the, t today, this afternoon, is the election. But what we'll be talking about the Bay of Pigs and the, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, Vietnam, a rather thin record on civil rights. And also what I'd like to talk about is a, at least initially, not today, but over time, a rather reckless decision-making style. And we'll talk about the, the Kennedy decision-making style and, and the way that we could, well, we could fast forward decision-making in the, in the presidency to escape the rather slow decision-making process, step-by-step, step, that, that Eisenhower adopted, the military style. So let's get going, and this is the very best I can do. You ready? I believe in America that is first, not first but, not first if, not first when, but first period. It's time to get this country moving again. It's the best I can do. All right, that's the best I can do. So, you know, let's, let's, wrap, let's wrap the 1960 election, you know, around that very phrase. It's time to get this country moving again. So let's, 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 back, the, let's back the story up, if you will. You know, let's move the dial, let's move the needle. You know, back to January of January of 1960. And in January of 1960, the Kennedy team and the chair of his election committee was Robert Kennedy, you know, who was a tough, arrogant, self-centered fellow, you know, who grew up over time. He, he needed some maturing. And as Robert Kennedy said to the staff as they, you know, gathered at the compound to plan, to plan the primary, to plan the to, to plan the convention, and then to to talk about a possible election strategy, that Robert Kennedy made it clear to everyone that we are going to campaign every day as if it's the last day before the election, the Monday before the Tuesday election, the weekend before the Tuesday election, and you can sleep, you can eat. You can spend time with your election, with your family after the election. This is going to be a full court press. This is a sprint, a sprint from February to the convention to the election, a sprint. And the reason I'm mentioning that is of Richard Nixon. Uh, there, was, there, was no, there was no doubt, you know, as who would be the Republican nominee. You know, but Richard Nixon saw the, saw the November, saw the general election, in a different way, and I'll come back to this. For him, for Richard Nixon, you know, it was, the election was a marathon, you know, rather than a sprint. And one needs to pace oneself and the election and the money and the attention of the electorate. But January of 1960, decisions, a decision had to be made as to how many primaries to enter. Uh, there were 16, and despite the wealth of the Kennedys, there was one, not enough money to be able to fund 16 primary primaries. And secondly, we do not want to get into certain primaries in which we offend a favorite son. And I'm thinking, let's say, of, of, of Brown, Governor Brown of California. We, don't, we do not want to offend a favorite son. We want that favorite son to come to the convention with a bushel basket of delegates and to endorse me. So of the 16 primaries, A, we don't want to offend anyone. B, we need to husband our money. So which, the, of C, which primaries do we enter? And when we choose which primaries we enter, 
We need to win every single one of them. And we need to be able to go to the convention within striking force of the nomination. And they talked about this. We have a Catholic issue. We have a religious issue. And we need to get out in front of it. Because if the, you know, if the, if the, if the nomination, if the ticket, it goes into the, the smoke-filled rooms, we'll never come up with the nomination. Because political memories alone, and it had only been 32 years earlier, you know, that the Democratic Party had nominated its first Catholic candidate. And that was Al Smith, Al Smith of New York, who was crushed by Herbert Hoover, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You know, the country was not yet ready, you know, in 1928 for a, for a Catholic president. In fact, Harry Truman, in retirement, made the observation, I don't think the country's ready yet for a Catholic president. So, so that's where, you know, that's where Harry Truman is. And, and so Harry Truman, will, I'll bring Harry Truman back into the conversation in a moment. So which of the seven are we going to enter? Now we're going to, we are not, because everybody will leave before I'm done. And I can't have that. Y'all got to hang with me. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take a look at two. We're going to drill down on, on two primaries, a Wisconsin and West Virginia. And then we're going to take the story, you know, into the end of the convention. Now this Catholic issue, we need to get out in front of it. You know, we cannot have it be a, a whispering campaign. You know, we need to confront it. We need to deal with it. We need to challenge the electorate to deal with it. As Kennedy would say, and did say, during the primaries and during the general election, you know, no one asked me my religion during World War II. I mean, no one asked me my religion when I skipped at PT-109. It didn't matter. I was wearing the uniform. We all were. We all were. We all were, we the people. And, and then he would follow that up, depending on the response, you know, depending on the crowd, you know, that I refused to believe that the day I was baptized a Catholic, you know, that I could not serve this country as its president. It's 1960. We're bigger than that. We're better than that. These are new days. This is a new frontier. And it may be a new frontier in the election of a president of a, from, from the Catholic faith. By the way, we've yet to elect a Jewish president. I mean, so there's another type of a frontier if you have. So I want to say this again. I refuse to believe the day that I was baptized a Catholic, that I cannot serve this great country as its president. Vote, vote your future, not your fears. You know, you know vote, vote, your, vote the promise, not the, not the worry. I promise you a new frontier. And not only that, and Kennedy, if the day comes when I believe as president or as a candidate, that my faith is in the way, and that I pike, Come on in, and I cannot serve this country. You know that the my faith is in the way that the you know that the Constitution is secondary to the to the Bible. I will resign. Now, whether he would have is is, a, is speculative, but I need to address this issue. I need to get out ahead of it, and we'll worry about a vice presidential nominee later. We're not even there, so it will be a sprint in the first election is the death, rather the first primary, you know, will be in the, um, in the state of Wisconsin. And I need to go to Wisconsin for a number of reasons. One, that Hubert Humphrey has declared his intentions to, to gain the nomination for his party. And Hubert Humphrey, the, the great campaigner, I mean, Hubert Humphrey in the neighboring state of Minnesota, and here's where politics, here's where geography, you know, here's where the electoral college matters. It's all the Electoral College, isn't it? Ask Hillary Clinton. It's all about the Electoral College. You can amass as many popular votes as you like. It's immaterial at the end of the day when you count up the electoral vote. That's what matters. We need to go into Wisconsin. One, that Humphrey's for Minnesota. And if Humphrey cannot carry Minnesota, or cannot carry Wisconsin, a neighboring state, a neighboring state, how can he possibly carry the country? So if I can knock him out in Wisconsin, I've knocked out Humphrey. Now there are others that were looking for the nomination. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was involved, by the way, and not Adelaide Stevenson. Uh, Steven, had, Stevenson had been nominated twice, you know, and, and defeated by Dwight Eisenhower. I mean, no one was going to beat Dwight Eisenhower. 
the uh, who, uh, who else was Stuart Symington of Missouri was interested. Uh, that was uh, that was Truman's guy. Uh, Scoop Jackson of Washington State was interested. So Kennedy had to pull away, and one way to begin to pull away knock out Humphrey in Wisconsin, and also in Wisconsin that the congressional districts are were almost evenly divided between Catholic and there were ten districts, ten congressional districts that between Catholic, predominantly Catholic, and predominantly Protestant districts. So I can, if I can carry a number of Protestant districts, you know, that'll begin to, that'll, that'll begin to diminish the Catholic issue. And also, you know, Wisconsin has a, an agricultural base, an industrial base, and if I could show that I can draw from farmers and workers, knock on Humphrey, uh, you know, challenge the people of Wisconsin you know, to vote your future, not your fear. You know, that I'm on my way. So I went to Wisconsin, you know, went the Kennedy campaign. And I have to tell you, and I, I really have to, can you picture with me, get the image with me, that here are these sunburned farms, you know, with their, with their coveralls on and their, you know, and their shoulder straps and, you know, they're, asking, they're standing with their back at the wall at some, at some primary meeting and here's candidate Kennedy and they got their thumbs in their, you know, in, in their suspenders, and who's this kid? Yeah. Who's this kid? Who's this skinny kid? What, what language is he speaking? I can't understand a word he's saying, Elmer. You know? Well, neither can I, Ebenezer. What language is he speaking? Well, he's speaking in his high cliff Bostonese. And Kennedy knew, and his aides knew, who found this very humorous. Kennedy does not know the difference between an egg and a potato. And he's talking about commodity supports on the Chicago Commodity Exchange. And here he is trying to sell himself as if he knows anything about agriculture. It must have been amusing, I would, I would think. So, Kennedy rolls into Wisconsin a brand new style of campaigning. Kennedy did not reinvent the presidency. Now, he did not revolutionize the presidency. What he did do is that he revolutionized the way that one runs for the presidency. A sprint, a full court press. And into Wisconsin, you know, he brought his own television trucks and television crews to get the footage that was shot in Wisconsin on that very day to the local cable news, to get it out that day, and not to rely on ABC, CBS, or, or NBC when they get to it, so that folks, folks in Wisconsin, the candidate Kennedy was in our state today. No wonder I couldn't drive around. No wonder I couldn't get through Brockton with your graduation. He was here today, and this is what the candidate said. And it works today. I mean, it's hot. It's warm. It isn't three days old coming when, when the major dailies, networks, get to it. Also, his own campaign plan, the Caroline. I do not want to wait for TWA. I want to make five stops in the state of Wisconsin, or wherever I'm at. And I'm going to be on my schedule, you know, not Pan Am. And there's the plane, keep it fueled, keep it running. We are going to skip around the state. Or we might skip between and among five states today. And I'm going to, I'm going to identify what today is known as wedge issues. You know, that term, a wedge issue. You know, what's an issue in this state? It might be gun control. It, 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 it might be abortion. What a wet today, a wedge issue. That's enough that, enough that I can carry this state, or enough that if I carry, enough to carry a congressional district. It's numbers, isn't it? At the end of the day, it's numbers. It's the number of people who vote for you, who mark X or check next to your name. That's what matters. Wedge issues, my own campaign plan, my own polling. I want to, I want to poll daily. I want to know what it's looking like. Who am I strong with? Who am I soft with? And I need to do this. I need all this death. Go, 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 go. And it was exhausting. And Kennedy, Kennedy wins Wisconsin by 56% of the vote. There's a but coming. There's always a but, isn't there? There's a but coming. He carried the Catholic congressional districts. He did not sweep any Protestant districts. And while I was able to get Protestant votes, I did not get enough to knock out, I, I won the, I won the, I, I won the primary. But Humphrey did not bail out. He followed me into West Virginia. And in West Virginia, 
This is where we're going to just drill down for a moment. West Virginia, this is where the Catholic issue would be front center. West Virginia, 95% Protestant. West Virginia, a hard scrabble state. West Virginia, coal, coal, coal. Donald Trump carried West Virginia by about 30, 35, 40% of the vote. I mean, it's still out there today, isn't it? So, I mean, that, that issue, that issue was still there today. So into West Virginia, not only came the Kennedy campaign, but into West Virginia, we need West Virginia. I'm going to nail the Catholic issue in West Virginia. Into West Virginia came the beautiful people, the beautiful people from Hollywood. Into West Virginia came the Kennedy family. And, and, and into West Virginia came the crew of PT-109. This man's a hero. Now, we know that when Kerry ran, he was swift-boated by his crew, wasn't he? And his reminiscences of the way he remembered Vietnam is not the way many others remembered Kerry's presence in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We all tell stories, right? And some are ghost stories, and some are fibs, and some are completely the truth. PT-109, the crew, came into, came into West Virginia. The man's a hero. The man's a hero twice over. The man's a, you know, here in the Silver Star for heroism. In fact, his old man, Joe, tried to put him in for the Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, uh, I don't want to get sidetracked, but Kennedy was not the commander that he thought he was in the Solomon Straits when that torpedo boat was cut in half by a Japanese destroyer. The men were asleep, the engines were off, were, um, were drifting. So it wasn't as if he was on the, uh, on the wall of the Alamo here in the Solomon Straits. Into West Virginia came the Kennedy team. Into West Virginia came the beautiful people. Into West Virginia came James Roosevelt, you know, the, uh, one of the sons, the eldest son, I believe, of FDR. And, the son, and James Roosevelt was recruited to speak in West Virginia and to bring up one issue repeatedly, again and again and again, to drill down on this. And, and James Roosevelt on the radio, James Roosevelt campaigning for Kennedy. When you see Senator Humphrey, when you see Senator Humphrey, will you ask him why he sat out the war my father died for? Will you ask him that? We have a war hero here. When you see Senator Humphrey, will you ask him why he sat out the war my father died for? Now, there was only one answer to that, and it was a bad answer in such a military state. I think today, I may be wrong on this, so you can check me on this, or at least certainly it was in 1960. But West Virginia sends the greatest percentage of its sons and daughters into the military. It's another career rather than mining and black lung disease and all of that. We know, don't we? Third, fourth, fifth generation mining. And Humphrey, not Humphrey rather, Humphrey did not have an answer that would ever work in West Virginia. The reason he did not serve in World War II is that he was 4F. Now, to be 4F in World War II, you really had to be 4F. If you were standing sentient, and when the recruiting officer put a uh, mirror under your nose and it moistened, you're in the army now. So there's nowhere to go with that. Nowhere to go. And again, vote your future, you know, not your fear. And for Kennedy, and some, you know, it's like a convert that you, he had never seen such poverty before. And it struck him, it moved him. I mean, his life was a life of elegance and money. You know, men with that kind of money do not have to carry money. I mean, when John Kennedy as president went to church and they passed the hat, the collection. I like to call it passing the hat. Pass the miter. He never had any money. And he would ask an aide with me, you got five bucks, you got 10 bucks, I'll, um, I'll pay you back in the afternoon. That never happened. You never ask the President of the United States when you give him, when you give him 10 bucks, you owe me 10 bucks. You know. Did Putin ever give that ring back to Bob Kraft? <laughs> I, mean, there, I mean, there you go. I mean, there are some situations, just let it alone. West Virginia is a huge win. And on to California. On to California went Kennedy. And following him into, into California, Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson is there. 
and uh, and Lady Bird, Lady Bird was you know was uh, was hoping LBJ would would get the vice presidency. I'll come back to that into West Virginia, uh, rather into into California, Los Angeles came St Symington, Scoop Jackson, Lyndon Johnson, a reluctant Adlai Stevenson, and John Kennedy. He's close. He's close. And he's nominated on the first ballot. Uh, and the only decision, or big decision, is who is he going to run with? And Robert Kennedy got himself deep into that. And Robert Kennedy, under no circumstances, you know, wanted Lyndon Johnson to run with his brother. Why? I loathe Lyndon Johnson. Listen to the way he talks. I mean, no one can understand a word he says, like the Kennedy should, should talk, right? And look how fat he is, and gross, and ugly, and sweaty, and the way he speaks, and to, and to run with my beautiful brother, so eloquent, so beautiful, so good looking. I mean, John Kennedy was catnip to women. I mean, let's tell the truth. And he was available, let's tell the truth as well. And, and, and John Kennedy effortlessly, or it seemed to be effort, effortless, that he could simply you know, pull Shakespeare out of the air, or Robert Frost, or Yates. And he had wonderful speech writers. And he knew how to deliver a speech, that he was able to slow down his clipped Bostonese, and not to step on his applause lines, and to measure his remarks. And, and, and we know, don't we, you know, that his, his speeches were well-crafted, most, most of which, you know, written by Ted Sorensen. His acceptance of the novel, I urge you to read it. I mean, it's, I mean, it's wonderfully written, but Kennedy is still learning to deliver. And Nixon listened to the novel. He said he speaks too quickly. He rushes. He doesn't wait for his applause lines. He does not allow people to stop in process. It's too quick. And he's still working on the delivery. And boy, did he ever have that delivery down at the commencement address. At, where was he? Uh, he was at American University in June of 1963. That's a speech. That's a stem winder. That's a speech that even Nikita Khrushchev remarked, that's the best speech of an American president since Franklin Roosevelt. So, so read the, read the novel. No, rather, read the, the acceptance speech. And at that ex acceptance speech, he crystallizes, he articulates what he means by a new frontier. And he took the opportunity of delivering, of delivering that concept in the West. And he talked about the frontier ran out of space in, in California, it, it, like a wave that ran out of space. And today, and, and today I promise you a, a new type of frontier a frontier in education, a frontier in race and civil rights, a, a frontier in science, a frontier in, frontier in the mental health, a frontier in physical education. This country has become fat, a, a frontier, a new frontier. And I ask you to join me in that new frontier. Give me, give me your hand, give me your help, give me your vote. And it's time to get this country moving again. Now, Lyndon Johnson, over the objections of, of Robert Kennedy, was chosen as vice president. And depending on how you read the, depending on how you read the leaves, the tea leaves, that without Lyndon Johnson on the ticket, and I'm part of this analysis, I'm part of this calculus, without Lyndon Johnson on the ticket, John Kennedy loses. <clears throat> look at the results. Look, how, look at how close the popular vote was. And in Texas, just Texas, Lyndon Johnson's home state, I mean, Kennedy won the popular vote in Texas by 50.5% of the popular vote. Do you think there was fraud in Texas? You bet. Do you think there was fraud in that election? You bet. We'll never know who really won the election of 1960. Until Gore and George W. Bush, that election was separated in terms of the popular vote by one-tenth of one percent across the entire country. That is a squeaker. We'll never know who really won that election. And here is Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson spoke their language. You see that slow Texas drawl, and going into Virginia, and going into, going into Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, 
you know, going in Louisiana. And Lyndon Johnson putting it on, he could put it on. Bill Clinton is a master at the voice, isn't he? He, um, he Bill Clinton is a wonderful speaker. He, or he still ha knows how to use his voice. And, and, and frankly, Mrs. Clinton wasn't. She ran a terrible campaign. She did not listen to Bill. I'm gonna do this on my own. I think it cost her the election. I didn't vote for either one, I did a write-in, and it wasn't me. I went somewhere else with my vote. The, just so Brockton knows, for all those of you who voted for the other, I was one of the other two. The, you're guessing, aren't you? You're guessing who I voted for. I think he guessed wrong. The, uh, I didn't hear it, but I bet you he guessed wrong. The, uh, so, so Lyndon Johnson going into Texas and slowing it down. And, and when Lyndon Johnson appeared at a, camp, at a campaign rally in Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, he always had the same approach. And it was typically Lyndon Johnson, you know, bigger than Texas. I mean, Lyndon Johnson was a volcano. Lyndon Johnson was a tsunami. I mean, Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson was Lyndon Johnson. He was Texas. He was cattle. He was oil. He was barbed wire. He was bourbon. I mean, he was Lyndon Johnson. And, and Mrs. Johnson wanted him out of the position of Senate Majority Leader. It was killing him. He was smoking too much, drinking too much. He preferred Scotch Jews, by the way. And, and, and he, he had had several heart attacks. It was killing him. And retired to the Vice Presidency. Mm -hmm. LBJ, he always had the same approach. The helicopter would show up and the crowd was down. The Red Carnival crowd, if you will. A fairground crowd. And everybody knows LBJ is going to speak. And LBJ, that helicopter would come in, thump, 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 and it'd buzz the crowd, buzz the crowd again. And then LBJ would lean out, lean out and wave, how y'all doing? Lean out to the crowd. Somebody in the back hanging onto his belt. Can't have him fall like five, you know, 100 feet, hanging onto his belt. And, at, and the third pass or the fourth pass, he'd take off his big, big Stetson hat, and like a, he would fling it like a, like a whipping dough around. He would fling it, he, like a frisbee. He learned how to put a spin on it and it would settle into the crowd. And it was always a gopher there. Make sure I go for the hat. Make sure I get it back. It's a hundred dollar hat. And I have to use it later this afternoon. But that's LBJ. LBJ, go, go, go. And when's, when's the last time? When's the last time, Brockton? When's the last time Lyndon Johnson lied to you? When's the first time old Lyndon lied to you? I'll tell you, that, that Kennedy, that Kennedy Senator is going to make a mighty, mighty fine president. And I am honored to run with him. And I urge you to vote for Senator Kennedy. That's a smart vote. That's a Texas vote. That's your vote. Make a mighty fine president. I am honored to run with him. So you remember that on election night. I got to go. I got to go. Lyndon's got to go. Great campaign. He liked pressing the flesh. I mean, he did. Big guy. Big guy. For, for, for Robert Kennedy, he's not beautiful. It, it's not chemistry, but it was. You know, when, when Lyndon Johnson was offered the vice presidency in, in Los Angeles, he accepted it. He accepted it. Bobby Kennedy came, went out of his mind came down the fire pole, came down the fastest elevator he could find, you know. Hey, that doesn't work at all. Uh, there's no sound there. Bang, 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 bang on the, on, the, uh, on the suite of rooms downstairs, Lyndon Johnson. And John Conway, all Texas, John Conway answered the door. How may we help you, Mr. Kennedy? How may we help you? I need to see, I need to see Senator Johnson. I didn't need to see him. Because he accepted the nomination. He wasn't expected to. I don't want him to. Withdraw it. Withdraw it. That was a courtesy. And Conley said, Sonny Boy. Call him Sonny Boy. I'm mean, John Conley. I'm mean, Sonny Boy, you go back upstairs and talk to your brother. He just called down here and he congratulated Lyndon Johnson and approved and said, Thank you for accepting that nomination. You go back upstairs, Sonny Boy. You're not in the loop. He loathed. Robert Kennedy loathed Lyndon Johnson. It's not dislike, it's visceral. It's loathing, absolute loathing. And there's no mystery in the Republican National Convention 
that you know Richard Nixon was the heir apparent. No question about that. The only you know the only question is whom would he run with, you know, and, and that was the uh, that was the only question as to his vice presidency for for um, for Eisenhower. And it's, we're talking about Kennedy, not Nixon, you know. But Eisenhower wasn't thrilled with Nixon, you know, getting the nomination. He would prefer you know someone with a, a business background, a military background. Eisenhower had had no respect for someone whose who's work employment was politics. Uh, there was something dirty and ugly, just a little snarky about it. But he certainly, he certainly did not want John Kennedy to be elected. Absolutely not. Too young, too lazy, too much money, and too, uh, and too much, as, as Eisenhower would say, too much girling, you know, chasing women around. You know, that he wasn't simply fit for the job as President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief. And the, so, so Nixon, you know, uh, you know, Henry Cabot Lodge is his vice president, you know, from Massachusetts, obviously, from the, that very shabby town, Manchester by the sea, you know, uh, you know that, that place. So there's your ticket, there's your ticket. And as the, and as the election begins, and, you, and the elections usually began uh, the, the day after Labor Day, when people are home and people paying attention, now they begin the 2020 election will begin the day after, the day before the off-year off off year elections in 2018. You know that there are committees already set up. You know that, beginning to investigate possible runs for the presidency, and House and the Senate already. I mean, it's already there. The endless campaign, the forever campaign. Nixon, coming out of the, um, coming out of the, the nomination, is well ahead of Kennedy. In terms of in terms of polling across the country, and I mean in double digits. I mean depending, you know, which poll you want to read, 10, 12, 15 percent. You know, very much ahead. And and and, and the candidates, and, and the candidates. You know, we we need to get the attention of the people. We need we I need to, I need to go really national. You see, there are I mean there was this whispering campaign, nonetheless, about Kennedy and the Bible and the Pope and so forth, and of course among Republicans. And this was among Republicans laughing up their sleeve and being in the know. Have you heard? Have you heard? Have you heard what? Have you heard that if John Kennedy is elected, he's going to rename the Statue of Liberty? No, no. I didn't hear that. What's he going to name it? Our Lady of the Harbor. I mean, I mean so that kind of stuff is out there, you see. That kind of stuff is there. And, and Kennedy, I need to debate Nixon. I need to go national. I need to square up with him, mano a mano. I need to square up with him. And now during the election, now I just want to back up just for a second, that, that part of that new frontier, it was also Kennedy presenting himself as a new kind of candidate, uh, a, new, a, new, a, new, a, new, a future new kind of president. Kennedy emphasized his youth. He was 43. Nixon was only 47. I mean, they're you know, almost on the same calendar date. But Kennedy, young, always ten, handsome, handsome, and that, I mean, this new frontier, also a new type of president, new type of president, and a new type of candidate. Kennedy made it clear during the campaign, in no circumstances, under no circumstances, do I want to be photographed wearing glasses. It's age, ageism. I do not want to be photographed, I do not want to be photographed playing golf. It's an old man's game. He enjoyed golf. Because of his bad back, he could only get in five holes in a round. And then you multiply by three and add two, and you got your score. I mean, that, that's how it is. That, that's how I do it. I don't golf. I don't have the patience. I just don't have the patience. Nor do I have the time. It's a maddening game. Even miniature golf is a maddening game. The Kennedy youth vitality photographed sailing with that full crop of hair, and he let it grow long. This is the beginning of long hair. This is the beginning of the beatening. Long to the top of my ears. It put, it put the men's uh, hat business, haberdashery business, out of business. You're sailing. Playing with the children. You know, uh, Jacqueline on horseback. And a beautiful wife with beautiful children, with a beautiful family. And, and, and Nixon had none of that, if you will. And Jacques Wilhelm. You know, my wife is, I would like to introduce you to my wife. Jacqueline Beauvoir Kennedy, isn't she magnificent? 
And, you know, she hated Jackie. She hated Jackie. Um, Jacques Wellen, Beauvoir, Canada. And she truly loathed being called First Lady. And as a guy, I would never realize this, but it makes perfect sense. First Lady, it sounds like a racehorse. It sounds like I ought to be in the Kentucky Derby. And I, I, I mean, I get that, but I would never have thought of that as a problem. The youth, the vitality. Oh, my aching back, it didn't come up. And to contrast with the ageism of Eisenhower. Eisenhower, the last president, born in the, 20th, uh, in the uh, 19th century, October 1890, October 11 of 1890. How do I know that? I don't have a life. Kennedy, the first president to be born in the 20th century, a full head of hair. And Kennedy, I'm not wearing, I'm not wearing a top coat. I'm not wearing a hat. You know, at that inaugural, we know at that inaugural, he's not wearing a top coat, he's not wearing a scarf, he's not wearing glasses, I mean, and he's not wearing gloves, and he's vulnerable. He's vulnerable to the cold, he's vulnerable to the elements. But I'm unafraid, because if one, if one is afraid, one cannot govern. And in Dallas, in November of 1963, again, he's alone, he's vulnerable, isn't he? Sitting in the back of that car. And this time, he's vulnerable not to the cold and the damp, and almost below zero temperatures, he's vulnerable to that assassin, isn't he? With a mail order, a mail order, mail order, $12 rifle. It doesn't get any worse than that. But we're here to celebrate the election. Eisenhower advises, Eisenhower advises Nixon, do not debate him. He needs the debate. You don't. Everybody knows who you are. And the Kennedy people, Making a point of this. What is, candidate, what is candidate Nixon afraid of? This is 1960. The American people deserve an open and fair and honest evaluation and discussion of the issues. I have challenged, I have urged President Kennedy, not for me, but for the American voter, that they need a, a full, frank, and fair discussion of the, of the issues. And, and Nixon is almost shamed into it. His polls are good. He's ahead. He doesn't need the debate. Kennedy does. And Nixon, I will debate him. I'm an expert debater. He was at Whittier, and he was at Yale. And he will accept the challenge to four debates. You know, four debates. And the first one was September 26, 1961. And, and Kennedy was arrested. He'd been campaigning in California, nicely tanned, looking good. Was, uh, and he had a dark suit on with a blue shirt and a dark tie to pick up the blue and the tan and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and, and his suit, a dark suit. Nixon had just spent the last 10 days, last 10 days, in Walter Reed Army Hospital. And he, he, in leaping out of a car in Georgia, and I mean, Georgia is always solid, solidly democratic, the solid South. And the crowds were enormous. And he was, he was enthusiastic and, and full of energy and, you know, as the car slows, you know, whipping the door open and jumping out, and he hit his knee, you know, on that, remember that heavy, how they had the heavy steel hinges? He caught the knee just right, it became, it, it became inflamed, infected, and he needed to go into the hospital, and he lost weight, and he, and campaign days are like pieces of gold. Each one is spoken for. Each one is addressed. Each one, each one is carefully plugged in to win an election. There, is, there are no spare days. There are no, there, there's no spare change. There's no spare days. He had lost 10 valuable days. And I need to get out of the hospital. And I'm going to debate him on the 26th. Kennedy was rested. He spent three days in a hotel room just drilling and drilling and rehearsing questions and answers, making sure he had the, no, the names of candidates, the names of world leaders, that he could spell potato. I made that up. Remember that problem? Yeah, all right. That, that, I've got, I, you know, that I'm, I'm just as informed as Vice President Nixon, a world traveler. And he was rested. He looked rested. He was ready to go. Mano a mano. And Nixon, Nixon had lost weight. He looked sick. He, he still had 101 temperature. 
he was still taking medication. And as the car slowed down at the studio and he stepped out, he hit the knee again. And down he went, you know, in, in, and, and he's dizzy, he's moaning, and his aides lift him up. And as he goes into the studio, you know, the program director, Mr. Vice President, please, we can postpone this. We can reschedule this. You look awful. Kennedy had been camp he'd made five campaign stops that day in Chicago. He's exhausted trying to catch up. And now he's just whacked that knee again. And he's got a gray suit on with a white shirt. He's got the collar. He's lost weight. Even though the collar's button is hanging like this, he looks haggard. He looks awful. And he's got a five o'clock shadow. And we all know the rest of that story. The, the uh, cosmologists came out. The makeup people came out and wanted to put that, that, that not the lazy shave, yeah, pancake makeup. And he said, absolutely not. Humphrey wore this makeup in Wisconsin, and the Kennedys made fun of him. He looked like an orange. It was, he said, I'm not going to look like an orange. We have, a new, we, have, we have this new product, Mr. Vice President. It's called Lazy Shave. It's clear. No one will know you're wearing it. So they, and under those Klieg lights, those studios are hot, and under those Klieg lights, it began to melt, and it began to drizzle, you know, down his nose, began to drizzle on it, began to form on the upper lip, and drizzle to the chin, and he began to melt away on television. And the term Tricky Dick, what, what Nixon was trying to do, and this makes perfect sense, he knew he knew he was leaking. He knew he was drizzling, and he's trying to catch it and catch it. And he's following the cameras when the camera is not on me to very quickly catch it and catch it. But what would happen is, I mean, there, there's more than one camera. It's hard to keep your eye on three cameras. Pay attention to what Kennedy is saying and, and formulate how you're going to respond. So he's, he's, the eyes are moving. The eyes are moving. And, and Tricky Dick is back. The eyes are moving, the eyes are moving. And Kennedy's campaign took a huge leap in the polls after that. He came across cool, confident, informed. That why would anybody be afraid of this man? There's no tail under his jacket. There's no horns hidden by his long, wavy, brown, reddish hair. And, and, he, and those numbers, not only did those numbers jump, but the crowds were roaring. This was a rock star. This, this is a concert. This is a rock star. This is a happening. I promise you a new frontier. It's time to get this country moving again. In fact, Nixon looked so poor, you know, that cardiologists were, were phoning in that he looked like a recovering, a recovering heart attack victim. That's how bad he looked. His mother, Hannah, called Pat and said, what's wrong with Dick? He looks awful. And he did look awful. Nixon never watched that debate ever, ever, ever. Bad memory. Never watched it. In fact, when he ran again in 68, there were no debates. It was Nixon, it was, it was Nixon taking questions from, the, you know, from, from a group of questionnaires. No debates. Hubert Humphrey wanted to debate him. And, Hubert, and Nixon, I am not debating Hubert Humphrey. I know what happened. I need a control camera, you know, not a, not a camera that's literally in black and white and exposing me. So the election, the election, this new frontier, youth, vitality, the debates, the debates. And in the, in the debate on foreign policy, and I want to make this point, and I'm looking for, I want all of you to go to the polls. You don't have to raise your hand. But in, in that, in those debates, Kennedy, the debate on foreign policy dealt with, and when's the last time you heard? Probably never. The islands of Quimoy and Matsu. Anybody? The islands of Quimoy and Matsu. They're about the size of this building. And the islands of Quimoy and Matsu were outer islands, the outer islands of Taiwan, Formosa. And they had they had been they were being shelled by, by the communists, by, by Mao Zedong. You know, and remember, Chiang Kai-shek got run out of China by Mao Zedong. You know, went to Taiwan. Formosa was the Japanese name. 
and, and claim that, that I represent mainland China. Now, Taiwan is about the size of Switzerland. You know, it, has, it has a population today of 23 million, and it's 100 miles off the coast of China. And we maintained that fiction, didn't we? That Taiwan is really mainland China. Richard Nixon will end that, end that fiction. So the Chinese communists were shelling Pimoy and Matsu. And, and Nixon was asking Kennedy, and, and, and they, they talked, I mean, they exchanged between one another. You know, would you defend Pimoy and Matsu? Uh, they, are, they, are, they are part of Formosa. Chiang Kai-shek is our ally. He represents mainland China. And back to the mainland, that was the, that was the chant of the, of, the, of the Chinese nationalists. Back to the mainland, back to the mainland. Will you defend, if you're elected president, Mr. Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, will you defend the islands of Quimoy and Matsu as the legitimate government, as part of the legitimate government of Taiwan? And Kennedy, this was a showstopper. Mr. Nixon, Mr. Nixon, the American people are not concerned about two islands, 9,000 miles from America. The American people are concerned, Mr. Nixon, about, and then he turned to the camera, are, ter are concerned about Cuba, the island of Cuba, 90 miles from, the Flo from, from Florida, and Castro and communism in Cuba. I want to know, Senator, what the Eisenhower administration, what their plans are for Castro and communism in Cuba, 90 miles away from the American shoreline. That's what the American people want, want to know from you and from the Eisenhower administration. He pulled it off beautifully. He knew exactly what the Eisenhower administration was planning. He'd been briefed. He's the Democratic nominee, you know, just as Trump was briefed about what's going on after he got the nomination. He knew. He knew that Eisenhower was planning to, to uh, invade, to invade and unhorse Castro in Cuba, just like he got rid of the socialist government in Iran. Uh, Iran got rid, of the, got rid of the socialist government in Guatemala. And he knew. He knew. But I can use this, you see. You, you step into my trap. And on election day, on election day, see Nixon, in his acceptance address, made a promise. I promised a campaign in every state. He just lost 10 campaigning days, didn't he? I promised a campaign in every state. And on the weekend before the election, so that is, where is Ken? He's campaigning nonstop. He's campaigning as a sprint, leaping from one mid, leaping from one midwestern state to another in his plane. In Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Michigan, the electoral treasure trove. That's where we're going to win this thing. And where's Nixon? He's in Alaska. He's in Alaska. There are more seals than voters in Alaska. Bob, Bob Finch, his election campaign manager, Mr. Vice President, why are we going to Alaska? It has three electoral votes. There are more Eskimos than voters in Alaska. You, we go to Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan. That's where we're going to win this thing. And Nixon, I made a promise to the American voters. And if I break this promise, even before I'm elected, there's no reason for them to believe that I will keep any promise that I've made. It's to Alaska. We know that Mayor Daley stole Illinois. I mean, he stole Illinois for Ruffy Kennedy. And he did, and he told Kennedy, I'm, I'm going to carry Illinois. I will carry Illinois for you. And, and, and Mayor Daley did. He's the last of the big city mayors. Mayor White was the last of the big city mayors. Oh, and, and so was Mayor Menino. Jeez. Politics are different in certain parts of the country. And, and what, and what, and what, he, and what um, Mayor Daley did in Chicago, because I'm Mayor Daley, I'm from Illinois. Illinois is a very disparate state. The, the southern state, the, the southern part of the state is all agriculture. The northern part of the state is industry and academics and, 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 and so forth. And what Mayor Daley did, Cook County, Cook County, I'm waiting for the results from upstate Illinois to come in, the popular vote. I'm waiting for the results from the downstate to come in. 
And whatever the difference is between upstate and downstate, Chicago will provide. And when upstate and downstate reported, guess what? Cook County put John Kennedy over the top. Nixon, after the election, was urged to contest it, recount. Nixon, I don't, I, don't want to be bad, I don't want to be sour grapes to the Kennedys. I like the Kennedys. I wish I could be like them. I wish I was so as smooth, as clever, as charming, as funny. You know, I mean, I mean, Ro you know Robert Frost had told Kennedy, I, the Titans about Frost, Robert Frost had told Kennedy, remember Robert Frost read a, a poem. He told Kennedy, Mr. President, when you're president, my advice to you, be more Irish than Harvard. Be yourself, be authentic, be genuine. That's a great line. Be more Irish than Harvard. That suggests a very kind of a polarity of interests and, and, and personality types. Nixon did not want to challenge Kennedy. I like him. I wish I was as smooth. I wish I did not have to wear a three-piece suit on the beach and wear wingtips. I wish I would, could be as comfortable. And Nixon was never comfortable in his own skin. He was never comfortable with himself at all. Kennedy certainly was. And, I mean, Kennedy had the gift of making fun of himself. And you know that when you can be self-deprecating and make fun of yourself, you're grounded, you're okay. I mean, his press conferences were completely unrehearsed and, and spontaneous. And one of the treats of going to the Kennedy Library is to, is to visit that section where he's, he's in a press conference, and he's funny, he's genuine, he's quick, he's likable. It's easy to like some. it's easy to vote for somebody when you like them, isn't it? It's like accepting marriage, you know, unless, unless you're nobility, then there's land and money involved. It's easy, it's easy, it's, it's easy, and a crown too, and a royal coach, and all that goes with it. It's easy to, easy to vote for someone when you like them. And Kennedy drew that black phone. He, he drew that black phone. If he had drawn the same, the same number of black voters as Stevenson had in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, Illinois, he would have lost the election. He would have lost those electoral hotspots. But he did not, and he did not for one reason, is that when Martin Luther King was arrested in Georgia for driving on an expired license, all right, and, 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 and having sit-ins in, in department stores that would only service white folk and not black folk. Uh, he was given a five-month ter five term, in not in jail, at hard labor. And, and his wife, Coretta Scott, was concerned he'd be shot, shot in the back, allegedly trying to run away. And she voiced that. And the Kennedys picked it up. And Robert Kennedy made a call to the judge. Now, this is interfering in, in judicial proceedings discussing the fact it didn't matter. The Kennedys do what need to, they need to do to get elected. All right? So uh, making the point that this is really unfair, five months for driving in, of hard labor for driving on an expired license, and it is excessive, but there was a point the judge was trying to make. This is the, just the beginning of the traction of the civil rights movement you know, that had begun after World War II. And so the sentence was commuted, if you will. And, and Daddy King, Daddy King, told the congregation, and this word, and you know black churches are political, and this, and this word went out across the country, and this is Daddy King. That's Senator Kennedy, Senator Kennedy, fine man, Senator Kennedy. Senator Kennedy dried the, you know, dried the tears from the eyes of my daughter-in-law. Marvelous man, marvelous man, a man whom all, that I recommend we all support for the presidency. And what King did in a metaphorical way, actually he did it physically, he, I'm taking off my Nixon button, he was a Nixon guy. Nixon called him for advice, I'm taking off my Nixon button and I'm putting on my Kennedy button. Now here's a man we can trust, here's a man that has the interest of the black community. And, if he, and he carried the black vote in those states. He was very thin on civil rights. It's his brother Robert who was much more aggressive on civil rights. So at the end of the day, with a very tight popular vote, that Nixon wins, rather Kennedy, Nixon, Kennedy wins in the Electoral College, 303 votes to 219. And the irony of this, and I'll close with this, 
Now maybe if they might have a question or two, or three or four. Uh, we're in daylight savings time, plenty of daylight. I can stay here till nine o'clock. My mother said so. Uh, I don't have to come in when the street lights are on. The, the irony of this is that there are few constitutional responsibilities given to the vice president, very few. One of which though, one of which though, is that he counts out the electoral votes. So when the electoral votes moved to DC and the, and the vote was counted out and we formally certified, they were counted out by Richard Nixon. So here's Nixon, you can see it on tape, counting out the electoral vote and announcing that John Kennedy has been elected as the next president of the United States. And it is in that spirit that I now declare that John F. Kennedy has been elected President of the United States and Lyndon Johnson, Vice President of the United States. That must have been hurtful. And he's gone, he's gone. He packs up in, in January of, of, of 19, 1961 and returns to California. Nixon does. Runs for the governorship of California, is beaten, and those historic words you're not going to have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. Pat Nixon was thrilled. She hated politics. And Nixon went to New York to join a prestigious law firm and to make real money, real money. And, you know, it's, uh, it's in New York that he meets one of the senior partners, and that's John Mitchell. John Mitchell's going to get Mr. Nixon in big trouble come war again, Attorney General breaking the law in his office. And that's another story on another broad topic for another day. And Kennedy delivering that wonderful inaugural, you know, written by Ted Sorensen. And, and Kennedy telling, telling Ted, 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 make it sound like, make it sound like, make it as, as memorable as the Gettysburg Address. That's a tough sell, tough sell. And, but it is memorable. You know, it's listed as one of the 10 of the most fun, I don't know what seven or eight of the finest speeches in, America, in the American political tradition. And in that speech, you know, that we will, bear, we will pay any price, we will bear any burden, that we will defend freedom in its hour of, um, of, of danger, of its gravest danger, maximum danger. And he challenged America, didn't he? And we know that that signature line, the take home line, you know, ask not, you know, what your country can do for you but what you can do for your country. And that, and that motivated millions of Americans, didn't it? He was inspirational. And there he is, alone in the cold. And that, and that air, that hot air coming out. And ask not, join me, join us. And this is a new frontier. And I'll tell you where he got that line, where Sorensen got that line. Sorensen got that line from Choate. He had gone to Choate. Kennedy had gone to Choate. And the headmaster at Cho, when he addressed the graduates at graduation, stole that line. He stole that line from the Greeks, but he made it his line. Ask not what you would, ask not what Cho can do for you, but what you can do for Cho. And one of the, it might, might have been Demosthenes, you know, one of, one of the Greek city-states. You know, ask not what you know, Athens can do for you, but what you can do for Athens. So, boom, boom. Boom. And that is the master sentence. A major speech has a master sentence. It always does. On Franklin Roosevelt, you know, the only thing we have to fear, every major speech, certainly in an inaugural, has a master sentence. And, and, and Kennedy galvanized the nation, didn't he? And, and now we've got to deliver. Now we have to deliver. And if you read that inaugural, there's very little, almost nothing, on domestic issues. Because if he knew, he said, I really, I didn't have a mandate. Most presidents like enjoy foreign policy. We will pay, pay any price, bear any burden. The, the torch has been passed to a new generation. And we will defend freedom in its hour of maximum danger. Vietnam, Berlin, Cuba. And that's all part of coming attraction. So bring a friend next time. And Brockton, bring yourself to this room sometime next month. I'm not quite sure when it is, but I'll be here. Let's fill the room. So it's uh... <laughs>